The Catechism of the Catholic Church, Baltimore Catechism Number Three, Lesson Thirty One, Confession, Number Four Hundred Eight. What is confession? Confession is the telling of our sins to an authorized priest for the purpose of obtaining forgiveness. An authorized priest is one who has not only the power to forgive sins by reason of his ordination to the priesthood, but also the power of jurisdiction over the persons who come to him. He has this jurisdiction ordinarily from his bishop or by reason of his office. Examples in Scripture, Psalm 31, verse 5, Proverbs 28, verse 13, Acts 19, verses 17 through 18. Number 409. Why must we confess our sins? We must confess our sins because Jesus Christ obliges us to do so in these words spoken to the apostles and to their successors in the priesthood. Whose sins you shall forgive, they are forgiven them, and whose sins you shall retain, they are retained. Number 410. How do these words of Christ oblige us to confess our sins? These words of Christ oblige us to confess our sins because the priest cannot know whether he should forgive or retain our sins unless we tell them to him. The priest must judge the penitent. In order to act as judge, the priest must know whether to forgive or to retain the penitent's sins. It would be impossible for the priest to decide, that is, to judge, whether or not the penitent should be forgiven unless the penitent made known the extent of his guilt and his sorrow. In the sacrament of penance, the priest acts also as the physician of the soul. He tells the penitent how to avoid sin and how to amend his life. Just as we tell a doctor about our bodily aches and pains in order that he can cure us, so also we tell our sins to the priest in order that he can suggest spiritual remedies. Since God has commanded us to confess our sins to the priest as his representative, we should not let shame prevent us from doing so. The priest, as God's representative, will advise and encourage us, help us solve our doubts, guide our future conduct, and forgive our sins in the name of Christ. He will never, under any circumstances, not even to save his own life, make our sins known to anyone else. Priests, bishops, and even the Pope must also confess their sins to a priest. Number 411. Is it necessary to confess every sin? It is necessary to confess every mortal sin which has not yet been confessed and forgiven. It is not necessary to confess our venial sins, but it is better to do so. It is not necessary to confess venial sins because they do not deprive the soul of sanctifying grace. It is better to confess our venial sins because when we do so, we have more assurance that they are forgiven and because we receive from the sacrament of penance special graces to help us avoid them in the future. Examples in Scripture, Proverbs 28, verse 13. Number 412. What are the chief qualities of a good confession? The chief qualities of a good confession are three. It must be humble, sincere, and entire. Number 413. When is our confession humble? Our confession is humble when we accuse ourselves of our sins with a conviction of guilt for having offended God. Examples in Scripture, Luke 15, verse 21, Luke 18, verse 13. Number 414. When is our confession sincere? Our confession is sincere when we tell our sins honestly and frankly. We must manifest our humility and sincerity in confession by telling our sins clearly and distinctly so that the priest can understand them. Persons who lack the power of speech may, if they wish, write a list of their sins for the priest. Persons who are hard of hearing should confess in places set aside for them so that neither they nor the priest will be overheard. Number 415. When is our confession entire? Our confession is entire when we confess at least all our mortal sins, telling their kind, the number of times we have committed each sin, and any circumstances changing their nature. By the kind of sins is meant the class to which they belong, such as blasphemy, missing mass, disobedience, theft. The best way to determine the different kinds of sin is to determine the virtue that has been violated or the commandment that has been broken. We must confess whether the sin was in thought, word, or deed. In most prayer books, there are lists of sins which help us to determine the kinds of sins we have committed. Circumstances that change the nature of a sin are those which add some new kind of wickedness to the act we have done. For example, if a person kills another, he commits a sin of murder, but the killing of a cleric is a circumstance that adds a new wickedness to this act and makes it also a sin of sacrilege. Examples in Scripture, Numbers 5, verses 5-7. through seven. Number 416. What are we to do if without our fault we forget to confess a mortal sin? If without our fault we forget to confess a mortal sin, we may receive Holy Communion because we have made a good confession and the sin is forgiven. But we must tell the sin in confession if it again comes to our mind. 
There are times when a person can receive the sacrament of penance without telling the nature and number of all his sins. A dying person, for example, or a large number of soldiers going into battle may not have time for a detailed confession. Before receiving absolution, they must admit that they have sinned, that they are sorry, and that they want to be absolved. Those who have confessed in this general way must, in their next confession, tell all their sins according to their nature, number, and circumstances that change their nature. Number 417. What happens if we knowingly conceal a mortal sin in confession? If we knowingly conceal a mortal sin in confession, the sins we confess are not forgiven. Moreover, we commit a mortal sin of sacrilege. Deliberately to conceal a mortal sin in confession is a sacrilege, because it is a grievous abuse of the sacrament of penance, a sacred institution of Christ. Number 418. What must a person do who has knowingly concealed a mortal sin in confession? A person who has knowingly concealed a mortal sin in confession must confess that he has made a bad confession, tell the sin he has concealed, mention the sacraments he has received since that time, and confess all the other mortal sins he has committed since his last good confession. Number 419. Why should a sense of shame and fear of telling our sins to the priest never lead us to conceal a mortal sin in confession? A sense of shame and fear of telling our sins to the priest should never lead us to conceal a mortal sin in confession because the priest, who represents Christ himself, is bound by the seal of the sacrament of penance never to reveal anything that has been confessed to him. The priest may not speak about anything he has heard in confession, even to the penitent who told it to him, unless the penitent himself willingly permits it. If any person overhears something that is told in confession by another, he may not speak of it to anyone. A person ordinarily should not mention to others what he has told in confession. Examples in Scripture, Ecclesiastes 4, verse 31, Luke 10, verse 16. Number 420. Why does the priest give us a penance after confession? The priest gives us a penance after confession that we may make some atonement to God for our sins receive help to avoid them in the future, and make some satisfaction for the temporal punishment due to them. It is a sin deliberately to omit the penance received in confession. A mortal sin if the penance is grave and imposed for a grave sin, a venial sin if the penance is light. If a person intended to perform the penance at the time he received it, the sins he told in confession are forgiven, but he is guilty of a new sin afterward when he deliberately omits the penance. A person should follow exactly the instructions of the priest as to the manner and time of performing the penance. If the priest does not give such instructions, it is best to perform the penance immediately or as soon as possible. Examples in Scripture, 2 Kings 12, verses 13 through 14, Daniel 4, verse 24, Joel 2, verse 12. Number 421. What kinds of punishment are due to sin? Two kinds of punishment are due to sin. The eternal punishment of hell due to unforgiven mortal sins, and temporal punishment lasting only for a time due to venial sins and also to mortal sins after they have been forgiven. We know that God demands temporal punishment for mortal sins even after they have been forgiven because God himself has made this known by divine revelation. Christ, by his death on the cross, made more than adequate satisfaction to atone for all the temporal punishment due to all the sins of mankind. But God wants us to perform works of penance ourselves in order to receive all the benefits of the satisfaction of Christ. Examples in Scripture, John 15, verse 6, 1 Corinthians 3, verses 12 through 15, Apocalypse 21, verse 8. Number 422. Does the sacrament of penance worthily received always take away all punishment? The sacrament of penance worthily received always takes away all eternal punishment, but it does not always take away all temporal punishment. The sacrament of baptism takes away all punishment, temporal as well as eternal, due not only to original sin but also to all actual sins committed before baptism. The sacrament of penance, however, does not always take away all temporal punishment due to sins committed after baptism. The dispositions with which one receives the sacrament of penance determine the amount of temporal punishment which will be taken away. Number 423. Why does God require temporal punishment for sin? God requires temporal punishment for sin to satisfy His justice, to teach us the great evil of sin, and to warn us not to sin again. Number 424. Where do we pay the debt of our temporal punishment? We pay the debt of our temporal punishment either in this life or in purgatory. We should do as much penance as we can in this life for our sins. Our works of satisfaction in this life help us to merit greater glory in heaven. 
The debt of temporal punishment is paid in this life according to the penance imposed and the devotion with which it is performed. The priest is obliged to impose greater or less penance in proportion to the gravity and number of the sins confessed. Examples in Scripture, 1 Corinthians 3, verses 12 through 15. Number 425. What are the chief means of satisfying the debt of our temporal punishment besides the penance imposed after confession? Besides the penance imposed after confession, the chief means of satisfying the debt of our temporal punishment are prayer, attending mass, fasting, almsgiving, the works of mercy, the patient endurance of sufferings, and indulgences. Examples in Scripture, Tobias 12, verses 8 through 9. Important Truths About Confession Most persons outside the Catholic Church think that it is a very difficult thing to go to confession. The truth is that confession is one of the most consoling features of the Catholic religion. Catholics go to confession with the conviction that they are really telling their sins to God. The priest is present as God's representative to give advice and encouragement, to settle doubts of conscience, to guide the penitent's future conduct, above all, to forgive sins in the name of Christ himself. Never under any circumstances, even to save his own life, may he reveal a single sin of the penitent. Sometimes we hear people say that it is enough to confess our sins to God without having to tell them to another human being. To these persons, we answer that God himself has commanded us to confess our sins to the priest as his representative. We must obey God if we wish to receive the pardon of our sins. With all these considerations before them, Catholics should not find it difficult to make a worthy confession, especially in view of the fact that they are always free to confess to a priest who does not know them. Surely it is the most unreasonable to conceal a mortal sin in confession. Such an act renders the confession useless. The sinner leaves the confessional still burdened with all the sins with which he entered and in addition with the new sin of sacrilege. He has the obligation of telling all the sins again. And if he has the misfortune of leaving this world without receiving the forgiveness of his transgressions, the sin which he was afraid to reveal to one person in private will be revealed to the whole world to his shame at the last judgment. In the early centuries, it was not unusual for Christians to make their confession publicly before the entire congregation. Moreover, a very severe penance was often imposed in those times, sometimes lasting for several years. Nowadays, the church is far more lenient. The modern penance is generally a few prayers that can be said in a short time. Hence, we see the necessity of supplying for our debt of temporal punishment by works of self-denial over and above the sacramental penance. We need not practice the extraordinary deeds of mortification performed by the great saints. Even the smallest deeds of self-denial, when we are in the state of grace, possess satisfactory value toward atoning for our debt of temporal punishment. And we can perform such works of satisfaction not only for ourselves but also for others, whether living or dead. When a person realizes that he has been guilty of many sins and doubtless has a great debt of temporal punishment to pay, it is always better for him to make as much satisfaction as he can in the present life instead of deferring it to purgatory. For our satisfactory works in the present life, unlike our sufferings in purgatory, not only pay our debt of temporal punishment but also merit greater glory for us in heaven. We should be very careful in preparing for confession to know exactly what sins we have committed, their particular nature, any circumstances changing their nature, and especially the number of times each has been committed. If we do not know the exact number of times, we should strive to know it as nearly as possible, or at least get an average number by the week or the day. Of course, strictly speaking, we are obliged to tell the number of our mortal sins only. Venial sins can be confessed merely by specifying their nature without mentioning their number. Indeed, venial sins need not be confessed at all. Yet, it is advisable to inform our confessor how frequently we have failed even by venial sins. Resolution Resolve never to keep back anything serious in confession. And if the temptation to do so enters your mind, remember that when confessing your sins in the sacrament of penance, you are speaking to God rather than to the priest. This was Lesson 31 from the Baltimore Catechism Number 3, Confession. For more lessons, see the links in the description below. Any likes to this video and subscriptions to this channel are appreciated. Thank you for viewing. God bless. In nomine Patris, et Filii, et Spiritus Sancti. Amen.